Hello. Hey. So I'm going to get started. Thank you very much for being here. I really, uh, we all really appreciate your attending. And we're going to run through a quick presentation. Uh, this is Tripsy and, and what Pistasonics is uh, put together. And I have a, an, a guest with me. I'll introduce in a minute. He'll also be speaking. Unfortunately, I wanted to do this for two podiums. We can't make that happen. So I'm going to be a little bit more relaxed be up front and we'll flip back and forth. So this Sonic has developed a system for histotripsy. And here's my regulatory disclosure. Unlike most that we see in meetings that come up with 15 nanoseconds, I do want to just cover a couple of points in this to let you know that histotripsy is probably pre-market. It is undergoing FDA evaluation as we speak. And we anticipate uh, good things from that. My purpose is to quickly cover three topics today. The first topic is going to be really around the mechanism of action. What are the characteristics of histotripsy? How is it different from other things? The second is to understand the workflow in terms of how histotripsy is delivered. And the third is we'll cover during this some preclinical and clinical results to give you a better idea not only of where we are, but how you can all help us in that age. Doing this in number of times, I've been able to kind of summarize histotripsy on one slide. And we'll be covering different elements of this, but fundamentally, if you had that if this lesion here, and you wanted to treat that in, with certain attributes. The first is non-thermally. No thermal energy being delivered. We're going to do it in a different way. Second, we're not going to use any needles or knives. It's going to be non-invasive. Third, we're not going to use radiation to destroy that lesion. We're hopefully not going to have any bleeding. And we're going to do it under direct visualization. It's kind of a what you see is what you get. And you end up, once you've calculated what you want, to destroy in a march, and you'll end up looking at an image after we've seen this void. That's the void where the lesion was. That's what histotripsy is. And histotripsy has some very specific attributes. One is it's very precise. So this block M has one millimeter in connection. Currently, what we know eventually be commercially available is going to be three by three by six millimeters. It can go smaller than one millimeter. 
Of course, if it gets too small, it takes longer. So we're trying to balance speed of treatment with precision in terms of how tight you want to be. You will seemingly preserve, I say seemingly, because so far we've not seen any evidence that you do not. So we preserve collagen-rich structures. Typically, if you have a blood vessel, that blood vessel will maintain its blood flow. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. You're going to do it, and acutely, you'll have this very sharp demarcation. And, and in fact, you all might not be able to tell if that cell there is actually cutting out. It's a very sharp transition zone over the next 24 hours. There will be an inflammatory infiltrate that comes in. And in that surrounding area, we basically can see two things. We see this homogenized area that some red cells in that will become apparent in a wide there. there. Uh, with a sharp transition zone, and it's perfectly over time, we will get a different kind of uh, cellular death mechanism or reaction. And we see some paratosis and necroptosis occurring on that borderline. Now, basically, I've just described an imaging based technique. Taking you uh, using ultrasound to target and localize an image, and then using ultrasound in a collimated to mechanically destroy the tissue. Surgeons, I'm a surgeon. Very like Sounds like it's in the language. Why would you be interested? So, really, really happy to have Joanne Vidalis de Bay here with us today. Joanne is a surgical oncologist is in Barcelona. And Jerron was the first two yeah. procedures he did. He was involved in the first aid. We'll talk about him a little bit later. And has participated in many parts. So, ironically, it's a surgeon in probably yeah. one of the largest, if not the largest, experience. Yeah. And so, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jerron to give us a little bit of an explanation about his trypsy and the workflow, how this gets done. Joe, thank you for you to attend this uh, presentation. I'm very happy to, to be able to present this in front of surgeons. We like to do things, and this is a nice way to do them without harm. So as, what you see here on the on your left, you see the device. You see the device that's going to do the, the treatment. And on the right, you see the treatment head, so the device that does the ablation. You see the image from that there, so at the same time that you're doing the treatment, you're seeing with the ultrasound where you're treating, and down there you see where it's the effect being done. One of the things that uh, is interesting in this case is that we, we have in this screen, and three features. One is that it's able to get MRIs, get CD scans, and fuse it with, uh, with the ultrasound, which is a, a device, uh, GA5000, GA which is uh, one of the best uh, ultrasound devices on the market. And on the left of the screen, you see how the treatment is being done in real time. This is the device. You see the features that I said. Normally, the, the treatment is being done under general anesthesia. So what that means is that the patient uh, is going to breathe. And in order to keep this breathing uh, the most uh, cold as possible, what we can do jet ventilation. We can do what is called low frequent, uh, high frequency, low volume. Uh, respiratory with the, with the anesthesiologist, and that's going to be interesting in order to plan our treatment. What you see on the right of the screen is this uh, this uh, membrane that is what holds the the liquid that's going to be between the, the treatment head and the patient, and this is a, a special uh, fabric. Uh, material that does not absorb ultrasound. So it's like you're doing the, the treatment without any absorption. Inside this membrane, 
there is a uh, gas uh, water that uh, allows us to target precisely the lesion and then treat it. And here is what we see in the screen that I mentioned before. So what we see uh, here in the in the right is uh, how the procedure is being done. First, first thing of all, we need to target very well the lesion. We see the lesion very well. We have a feature that allows us to download a little bit more the ultrasound growth in, in order to target better. And with this, we adapt the, the lesion with the margin. You see there in the, in the, in the lesion, you see that there is a, a, a green line, which is the tumor, and an orange line, which is the margin. And as I said before, because we are going to have the patient reading in the general anesthesia, we need to calculate that this reading is going to be inside the margin that we have uh, predefined. So we are aiming that, and then what we're going to do is going to personalize the treatment. So this treatment is in four phases. First one is targeting. Second one is configuration the, the sphere. We have to think that this is a volumetric treatment. It's a sphere or an ellipsoid, which is these two types of, uh, of figures. And then here, what the, in, in the third uh, point, what we, what we do is personalize the treatment because we're going to adapt and configure the system to the texture of the lesion that we're going to have, to the texture of the, of the tumor. And we have four, uh, uh, seven points where the, the device is going to be taking us to configure the voltage in order to adapt exactly the energy that we want to deliver to the lesion. And the last one is what we see and we treat. So we treat and treating, we see uh, at the, at the, in real time, what was going on and sorry. And after doing the treatment, we see what we have obtained. And this is the lesion with all the tissue of the tumor melted inside, cavitated inside the, the organ that we have uh, done. Then when we have done the procedure, we need to evaluate that and we can do it either right away. In, in our case, we do it with ultrasound enhanced ultrasound to see it, or we can do same day, next day, an MRI to check what we have done. And here is what I was commenting here. This, uh, this uh, sphere that we have here is this is where we put all the tips, the points where the system is going to go. And in each point of this, we're going to calculate the, the voltage that we need to adapt the energy that we need for each one. So it's it's very precise and very uh, personalized. Uh, Back to you. So histotripsiation SARS is a sequential procedure where you identify the lesion. You drop the head down, plan specifically for that with the margin, and, and you determine that margin. Uh, then you are going to take eight segments, the seven segments on that lesion at the extremes of the X, Y, and Z axis. This is all software controlled, so you don't have to do anything. It moves automatically. You just start it. You create these bubble clouds, which tells you how much energy you need in each. That is then analyzed within the software to give you this treatment that is for that individual patient. At the end, uh, because it's volumetric, it will tell you how long it's going to take. Uh, typically, in the, in the twenty to twenty minute range, depending on how it is. Now, this is not a new technology. Uh, Histotripsy was first uh, really used into try to develop it in the human use in 2002. It's a long, long history of development with lots of really important peer reviewed papers and very significant journals. Today, I can, even though the slide says 250, there's well over it. There's a lot of literature. So this is not something that somebody went in the garage and came up with. And it's undergone lots of different iterations and development to get to where it is today. 
What Joanne was describing to you is what's shown on this slide here, and that is the creation of cavitation bubbles. So this bubble cloud that's here, this cavitation, it's an on and off phenomenon. If I turn the device off, that bubble cloud goes away. But if you look carefully at this point here, you'll see as that bubble cloud hits it, it destroys the tissue there. What's happening is, is that we're creating some inertial cavitation in that is dissolved gases, even probably some water molecules are being stretched, and it results in complete tissue dysfunction. That is the prostate of a dog. The focal point that is created is determined by the head and the, the geometry of the head. Now, I can take my hand during a treatment and pass it above or below this and nothing will happen because there's no concentration of sufficient amount of energy. And we've documented that in multiple animal studies as well as some human studies that there's no tissue damage occurring distant from the tree. This is very different than haifu. I just want to dissuade you from thinking this is haifu. Yes, it is an ultrasound technology. Yes, it does use ultrasound. However, haifu is based on heat and on continuous delivery of energy. Histotripsy is based on mechanical destruction. And most of the time that the device is on, there's actually nothing happening. There's no uh, pressure waves being delivered. And for that reason, it produces a very different response than you would see with histotrips. We've seen the precision, and I just wanted to highlight that again. And this is what the histotrips lesion that you've created looks like. You can see everything in there is destroyed. There's not any thermal damage. It's a gelatinous liquid filled with membranes and species of, <clears throat> of cells, but no intact cells. And if, again, histologically I look, I wanted to show this for two purposes. One is just to be able to look at what a typical thermal pattern looks like, where you have your clear three zones of injury, your thermal fixation, your coagulating necrosis and your transition zone, which is what we see with ablation. With histotripsy, we don't see that. We just see that sharp demarcation and we don't have any coagulant necrosis. That might be a fairly old statement to make, so I wanted to prove to you that. In this study, we're looking at specific antigen being released by the tissue and then, and then looking at how we're, how, what we're seeing in terms of CD8 cell activation to those specific foreign antigens. And as you see in the histotripsy group, you will get activation of the T cells. To stem now locally, you'll see it in tumor draining lymph nodes, but not in non tumor draining lymph nodes. And you will also see it systemically. So we are preserving antigens in this process. A curious phenomenon of histotripsy, unlike anything else that I'm aware of, is the rapid involution of the area you treat. Most of this is seemingly occurring through uh, retraction, tissue retraction. You can see the skin dimpling right there quite well. However, in the liver, I, there's also some suggestion there could be some regeneration, but so that really needs to be worked out. A lot more research to be done. But these lesions typically by three months are about, or the void has gone down to about 80% of its original volume. And we would anticipate that by a year, we won't have much left. They, they're, they're gone. So we think there might be some advantage in terms of following patients for local re regional, for local recurrence because of the change that left. Basically, like if you look at this kidney one, it looks like the other one will get there. Now, we've talked about collagen-rich structure preservation, and as you see here, um, this study was done looking at, and I, I, I always chuckle when I talk about this slide, because this is a slide where if you're a PhD or an engineer, imagine a one millimeter vessel would be considered a large artery vein. We can this at the audience. So in that study, a large artery vein is any structure greater than one millimeter in size, and they're all preserved in the animal studies that were done. And you see on the right different panels. As you get smaller and smaller, you do get disruption of vessels. So that when you're in the really left 30, um, 20 to 100 micron range, the 300 micron range. 
for arterial feedback. You just dropped them, which is why they were some red cells in the life. <laughs> Here you see some typical post treatment examples of portal vein in the pig liver, hepatic arteries in the pig liver, what it looks like and how that extracellular matrix is being preserved. And on the right, treatment of a bile duct right through the bile duct with preservation on the EBIS MRI. Now, we've done two human studies, and one of those is was actually the lead person for that is Joanne. So Joanne now will tell about the Teresa study. Yeah, that was our first human trial. It was very exciting because uh, it was the, we were going to do the first patients, and we treated uh, eight patients, 11 tumors in these same patients. Uh, what we see here in these treatments were five uh, liver, rectal liver metastases, one breast, one colangiac carcinoma, and one primary metastolar carcinoma. 100% technical success for what we decided that we were going to ablate and we obtained this ablation. So what we were going to do there, there in this study was just fixing what ablation, why, why, what, what I wanted to do. And then if we were able to complete this ablation, that's it. And we obtained it in 100%. It was uh, one failure in tumor coverage because it was too deep to already probably uh, we didn't aim very well to the to the to the seeing of the of the of the lesion. No adverse events, no significant adverse events, no pain at all, and that was very huge for our point of view. And uh, with an excellent response uh, of the of the lesions, some of our patients would, would be saying next day that but you, did you really did something to us because they never felt anything. It is one of the of the patients that we did that we have selected this because we treated three lesions in the in the left lobe of of the liver, and you see here that. Uh, well, here's the, where, where we were considering what limit do we have. Uh, in the study, we were not able to, to go farther than three centimeters, but we did this uh, with no problem. We have to see here also a very interesting feature that inside this, this is a contrast that has uh, ultrasound, and we see inside of the, of the lesion a patent vessel that is, uh, that is working and it's inside. So it's uh, so the feature like that preserving ducts and vessels. It's been seen here in this, uh, in this MRI, in this uh, condition actually also all the time. And this is another curious uh, biological response that we saw. That was a patient uh, with uh, multiple colorectal liver metastases. We only treated one of these metastases, and this is what happened in the, in the rest of the liver metastases. So we saw that uh, one week after we saw this, uh, this like like the lesions were a little bit swelling, and then they started to reduce all of them. And two months after, we see that this dramatic reductions of the rest of the lesions that were not targeted and were not treated. And also, we see the systemic effect. We saw that the CEA of the patient was going down. And when when it was uh, six weeks of the treatment, uh, we commented that to the medical oncologist of this patient, and they decided that because he was out of treatment, he was in palliative care, and they decided that this patient deserved chemotherapy. And after that, we he he, he was living one and a half years. So following that study and the success of it. Uh, we undertook two, two trials. One is the Hope for Liver study, which is in the EU and Europe. The other is the Hope for Liver study in the US. And we now uh, treated two of the patients, and we've submitted on the basis of the first 40 evaluable subjects for most of the US and it's the EU. Uh, they're sequential uh, to the FDA for investigation. Just like the trial that Joanne talked about, those were end stage patients that really studied based on altruistic volunteers. They had no therapy. And mainly, this trial can be defined in the same way, which is how the FDA wanted it to be done. It is a prospective <laughs> multi center randomized trial, a non randomized trial. There were 15 sites, all patients, 
had to have failed multiple strategies. They couldn't be a surgical candidate. They couldn't be a transplant candidate. There was maybe one, I think, one patient where they basically wanted a therapeutic the month, so they refused, and therefore could be sent in. Patients couldn't be on chemotherapy or immunotherapy. They had to be off them for 40 days. They had, then they had to be off them for 30 days. Safe. Dr. Arbaugh, can you turn your microphone on? Thank you. Yeah. I apologize. <laughs> Technology things we deal with. Uh, the endpoints were not determined by us. They were determined <laughs> by independent groups. It was CDC, a DSMB, and an independent imaging lab. Um, and remarkably, only one person had any experience, one of Dr. Jovet's colleagues. And what I can tell you is looking at the patient population, not too, you know, not the best in terms of. 26 of the 44 patients that we we ended up with 44 patients because four lesions were unvaluable by the imaging lab, not because of the, the, the images didn't come out good enough for them to be able to ascertain. So we had to go to 44. We did a bootstrap analysis to make sure that it was all okay. It wasn't. So 26 were stage four patients. And then those HCCs are all stage, at minimum stage two, maybe stage, but mostly stage three. There are three patients, I think, in that group that are stage four. One of the things that you might think about with an alpha sound based technology is the visualization. Obviously, that is something that's important. Joan talked about that. We do have image fusion. It's deformable image fusion. So you bring your CAT scan or MRI in, you ultrasound the patient, the two connect to each other, and the CAT scan will be deformed to what your image is showing you on the ultrasound. It's not perfect. You know, it's not 1000% accurate, but it's much better than looking at one and the other trying to match. And the case he talked about really was a good indicator that that would be necessary because in that case, they were doing it off of landmarks. Now, despite the fact that we know some of the limitations of ultrasound and the fusion not being present in this trial, you should only could use ultrasound. All segments of the liver were targeted, except for one, which was an excluded segment in the trial. And it was excluded because the FDA wanted to exclude something. So we excluded segment one. And we were not able to achieve anything in, seven, in segment seven or eight. I don't know if that's true or not. But we did have treatments that occur across the, set, the liver and in all segments. And so while I'm not telling you that you can target anything at the moment, they're all achievable. So with that, as I've said, it's been submitted to the FDA. We're very optimistic. Uh, remarkably, we've, uh, in our feedback from the FDA and their request, they really didn't ask anything about the clinical data. So I think we're, we're in pretty good shape there, having you know, uh, achieved both endpoints. And we have to achieve both to have succeeded. And we have a pretty robust uh, series of studies that we're planning to do going forward. So in summary, histotripsy is non-invasive and non-thermal and non-ionizing mechanism for destroying tissue. The indication will be, will be used for the destruction of liver tissue. It does not produce coagulative necrosis, at least as best as we've been able to determine in all our research studies. It doesn't have any. It undergoes rapid involution, preserves seemingly, it spares. I always get tripped. I don't. Never say never, right? So I'm just going to stick, stick to it spares collagen rich structures. You monitor the treatment and see the treatment in real time. Really, you're seeing what you're treating. So it's not, in some ways, unlike surgery. And I'm going to make a really bold statement surgery. This is more precise than you can be as a surgeon. Because literally, you pick the margin. If you say it's five millimeters, it's five millimeters. It's software controlled. You can continuously do it, and it has targeting simulation as well as individual doses. So it, I'm really anxious to get the questions that you might have, because I think that's where the real important part of this whole thing is, based on that information, what you think and what questions we have raised in your minds. Because I do think we might be looking at something that was inconceivable yesterday, but today, as Tom Sarville would say, is routine. So hopefully the FDA will see that as well. And now I'm opening it up to questions. And thank you for the time and for being here.
I'll give you the mic, Josh, and then you can get the mic. How are you? I know you. Good to see you. So the question about uh, how you overcome the rib interference, um, you said a seven and eight so far has not been treated, but you say it's going to be achievable. So what is the strategy of the- Yeah, so thank you very much, Tim, uh, Dr. Tom. Um, there's, uh, in some ways, there's some degree of a misconception that occurs with ultrasound, and that is that ultrasound does not go through bone. Ultrasound does go through bone. We are well able to penetrate and deliver treatments right through the bone. We treat through the skull and have a whole research project on cranial isotrips. The problem is imaging. You can't see because your ultrasound images, you know, is based on the reflection of the ultrasound wave back and it gets blocked on a rib coming up. We have created, uh, done a lot of research in animals to ensure that when you're treating through the rib, you're not delivering so much energy that you would heat the bone. There will be some absorption of the energy. When you're doing your treatment, you are actually dosing on those spots based on that. So the real challenge has been, for the most part, not the bone blockage per se that would occur in the energy delivery, but the bone blockage in terms of seeing. And we believe, at least initially, the first step towards that is the image fusion. Having said that, if you're all covered by bone, uh, you know, we might have some issue. However, I can tell you that in our hope for liver trial, we never exceeded more than using 65% of the energy output that the device could deliver. So I'm confident we will be able to do more, but I'm also confident we need to do, there's work to be done. Did that answer your question? Okay. Thanks for bringing this here. Uh, Aaron Burgle, Cleveland, uh, Ohio. There's a lot of excitement in the population world about this. So I have a few questions. What is the, what is the largest size of the population zone that you can create? I mean, the literature when I reviewed it looked, looked like it was three centimeters. Maybe you can comment. And then do you get birds along the track? Right. So two really important questions. And I want to... I'm going to set that up by starting by saying, humor me, we do not do ablation, we do histotripsy. So we are destroying locally this tissue, but just to separate from, in most people's minds, ablation is a thermal process. And so I'm trying to stick to that because that piece then becomes yours. As I noted, noted earlier, there is no trash. Can you put the fourth, uh, this fifth slide up? And I'll tell you to go back or forth. So basically, it's, it's kind of like a laser in the sense that you're collimating a beam of light in the laser. Here, you're collimating a beam of ultrasound mechanical pressure waves, or they're pressure waves. The intensity of those waves above and below this is not enough to cause any damage. So if you were talking to the track, that track would go from here to here, and we don't see any damage. You can put your hand in the in the water bath and you come up to the room, the device is there, incidentally. If you have time, you should really go up there because I can fill out all this stuff. We're sort of seeing, putting your hands on it will be amazing in terms of you making an assessment. So I can put my hand above or below this. Occasionally you will see perfusion deficits on the imaging following treatment. Just knock off these little blood vessels that you see. And they go away. Usually, by putting the case that in Other questions? Oh, sorry. Oh, thank you. So, uh, there's two aspects to this thing. This is a volumetric treatment. So, in a volumetric treatment, it's basically a driven head that's rotating around and it has a particular speed. So, we can tell you the size and how long it's going to take. If you have a force in your area that you destroy based on the speed that we're currently operating, it's probably going to be somewhere in between that 20 and 30 minutes. You probably don't have a lot of patience. So we've never done anything more than three seconds. That doesn't mean you can't. That's one half of the question. The other half of the question. So we do it. So three centimeters, probably. Yeah. 
Yes, I would say that, that once the dinner is more or less five, six minutes. So that will be around in between 15 and 20 minutes, three centimeters. So if you go four centimeters, the margin though, going from three to four is a substantial. The second half of the question is one that I don't know, which is why Joan showed the image with three treatments. I have no idea how much volume you can destroy a volume. If you know, in the future, it might be able to go second and two. I don't know. I really don't know. So there's a lot of open opportunity for all of us to work at trying to define the limits and what the tolerability of it is. That patient had three lesions of the three centimeters in size, which is not the same as doing nine centimeters, but it's still a pretty substantial volume, and she did it. It was a question of me. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I've been following this for a while, and I just have a couple of questions if you don't mind. That's what I'm here for. So the proof was a comment about the uh, trial in Spain that commented on two out of eight cold biologic responses. I'm going to assume one of those is the CEA decrease. But can you clarify? Uh, my first question is, can you clarify what you mean by biologic response? The second question um, has to do with you had one slide that said that the mechanism of cell death induced ferroptosis, uh, but I didn't see necessarily data from that. So I'm curious yeah. about that comment. And the, the third is very related, which is in the mirroring model, you showed a, a um, histogram of increased CD8 cell infiltrate. I assume that's Cliff's data. If you can confirm that's from Cliff's uh, data that I've seen before, and that have you looked at any of that in the correlative clinical trials that you now showed us a long list um, as to whether there is increased CD and infiltrate of it? Really important questions. I'm just answering some. I'm going to have to go on and answer the lab. It looks like trying to start with that. Kind of thing. I didn't show you any paraphysics data. Paraphysics data does come, does come, does come from the trials. As does. No, we've not. Uh, we've done immunology, but as you know, it gets really messy in these small studies. So I can't tell you from uh, looking at CDA cells in any of the studies. Now, he also said there's a lot. Most of the studies are to be done. The studies that we have done are the first three. <laughs> which is the recent study in Barcelona, the other two. The question around ferrotosis and necroptosis, that's what Cliff is determined in his lab. And it gets a little bit confusing because the original ferrotosis and necroptosis in the center and freely in the outside. When we talk about Cliff Cho's research, or actually we can also talk about Coy Allen's research at Virginia Tech, looking at the immunology, since you asked the question, I didn't answer it. I try not to talk about things that I'm not supposed to. Those are done with partial treatment. So we they partially treat the lesion. They don't completely treat the lesion, which therefore allows them to better understand these mechanisms. And there is a study from the University of Michigan published in Cancers last year, which shows when you treat that lesion partially, you actually see an aggression of the lesion you treated and an elimination of metastatic disease around. When we refer to this term, you know, if we were walking a fine line, look, I'm not going to sit here and tell you to have an escalable response. So all I can tell you is the biologic or systemic response, and maybe systemic response would be a better term. I'm not trying to step over any. The patient that you did see, and Joanne will now comment on the other patient, which we said HCC patient, what we see. As far as the hope to liver, we're right now focused, you know, I think, I don't think, my, my goal or my rule is we're going to get through this FDA and we're then we can do a lot of post hoc analysis. It wasn't one of the endpoints in the studies, so nor was the system designed for it. So I can't answer that in the hope for liver. There are two patients in Barcelona. So can you comment on those? Yes, uh, I would say that uh, we have one of four out of four, and it, it was, we have eight cases. So two patients that had this response that was would go further than. The ablation itself, the subscription uh, above, above the tumor. So there was this case of the HCC patient, the Vatasolar gastrointestinal patient, that they had the other lesions that were stabilized, and then the alpha fetal protein went down to the 
two months. And then the patient that I mentioned that was just treated one lesion, all of the lesions of the remaining part of the liver, that was a multiple liver metastasis, shrunk, and the CA went down almost until normal. So that's something that has happened, just treating one lesion. So we can call it systemic effect, we can call it immune effect, we can call it yeah. biological effect, but it's an effect that goes further away than, than the, the, the only statistical one lesion. And just, uh, uh, those, those are really important questions. Thank you for asking. You know? And I'm going to talk a little while about you. I'm just trying to look at it. And now, that part of it is a bit of a bit of a problem. Where do I want to see it? So, I think about a lot of things. Something just happened to me. Okay, that call out. I was almost going to say, I'm going to change this, but I'm not going to leave it the way it is. Maybe I'll get another question. Just one comment on that. I think it's a big one to me, but I think something similar to now in the world, so I don't think it's a lot of the study, short of the people, it's not a big one, it's a lot of people, but I think it's a lot of people. And so that's why I'm trying to do it. It's a phenomenon that happens in the signal. And this is quite, I mean, there's a lot of things that kind of interesting things to me. Yeah, well, I'm ever comfortable with any of them here. And we all know that people, if my mice were a good time, we can hear again. So, do I have any other questions? One more question. Yes, yeah, sir. No, uh, start. Great presentation. Thank you. I will ask the same question I asked Josh 30 years ago. What about superficial regions? Somehow, I still don't see those. And then all the new jobs. So, thank you. Definitely. So, one of the things I forgot to say, I showed you a large number of publications in that 250 years up around And one of the things I forgot to say is that what's curious to me, having read, yeah, really, it's pretty boring, read all, all those articles, is that what you see in one tissue and you see in another. I've not yet come across, I'm sure we will. This is the problem of speaking is that I don't want to make any flat out statements because we will, there will be patients that will have pain just because Teresa didn't have it. There will be patients that probably may get bleeding. Getting right to, that's what we do. We Somehow as surgeons are, I used to say a surgeon is great at having <laughs> patients like it, it becomes an issue. Histotripsy can be delivered pretty much anywhere in the body. There's no issue with the delivery. It really comes down to the treatment. I happen to be a champion of shallow lesions. I'm sure you can fire those grass lungs, lymph node dissections. We have preclinical research. Our current plan, though, is to maximize what we have. That's why everything we talk about is deep lesions. We've done this, we've just been approved for kidney, IDD, and solid renal mass. I'm completing the work on putting together a feasibility study for the pancreas. You will see that coming. And I think with that, we need to vacate the room. I really appreciate your attention and engagement. My email was at the beginning. Many of you know who I am and know me personally. Please reach out to me if you have any questions, if you want more information, if you want any papers. And by all means, the best place to find me today, because I will only be here today, is upstairs on the third floor. If I go up there, see the device, make your own assessment. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And thank you, Joanne, for coming all the way. Well, I'm going to